Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this IIEA webinar. And I would like to extend our thanks to the Embassy of Japan in Ireland for assisting us in arranging today's event. We're delighted to be joined today by Professor Yuichi Hosoya, who has been generous enough to take time out of his busy schedule to speak to us. Professor Hosoya will deliver an address for about 20 minutes, where he will discuss the implications of the war in Ukraine for the Indo-Pacific region. After Professor Hosoya has concluded his presentation, we will proceed to a Q&A with our audience. You will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screens. Please feel free to send in your questions throughout the session as they occur to you. And please be sure to include your name and affiliation with your question. You can also join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And a reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Now let me formally introduce Professor Hosoya before handing over to him. Dr. Hosoya is Professor of International Politics at Keio University in Tokyo. He is currently visiting fellow at Downing College, University of Cambridge, and research director at the Asia Pacific Initiative. Professor Hosoya was a member of former Japanese Prime Minister Abe's advisory panel on reconstruction of the legal basis for security. His research interests include British diplomatic history, Japanese foreign and security policy, and contemporary East Asian international politics. So we're very pleased to welcome him here today and we're looking forward very much to hearing his presentation. So without further ado, I will give you the floor, Professor Hossel. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Ambassador Niali, for your very kind introduction. And also, uh, thank you. I'm really grateful for, for IIEA for hosting me at uh, your prestigious and influential institute. And I'm particularly very, very glad that uh, today I am focusing on the perhaps the most important issue, the Ukrainian war and the current uh, crisis in the Ukraine and the relationship between Ukraine and Russia and its particular impact upon East Asian or Indo-Pacific international relations. Because many people, experts and policymakers are now wondering further, the crisis will result in Chinese invasion upon Taiwan or the Chinese efforts to, uh, military efforts to unify the country. So now we are in a very difficult situation in international affairs. And you know, maybe we are now living in a turning point in world history. So the result of the current Ukrainian crisis will undoubtedly affect the future course of history. So uh, we, we are naturally very much uh, curious and uh, 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 really interested in the direction about uh, the current situation. So I will try to link the two issues. One, on one hand, I will, I, I will focus on the importance of the Ukrainian war and it, in its impact upon Indo-Pacific international relations. Uh, first, I'd like to use uh, my PowerPoint slide to uh, explain my talk. I will share my uh, PowerPoint slide with you. Can you see my PowerPoint slide? Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. So the, the title is Impact of the War in the Ukraine on, and uh, its impact on, uh, upon uh, Indo-Pacific uh, region. And the subtitle is Japan, the EU, and the free and open Indo-Pacific. Previously, I actually prepared a PowerPoint slide, which uh, simply focused on Japanese foreign policy and Japanese policy strategy of the free and open Indo-Pacific. So I felt relaxed because I finished uh, completing I finished uh, making that PowerPoint slide. 
but in the middle of uh, February last month, the crisis uh, uh, became war in, in, on the 24th of February um, last month. Uh, Russia uh, began a massive military attack upon Ukraine. So I suddenly changed my mind to include that because uh, well, we uh, cannot expect a quite peaceful, stable international order under the current situation uh, because of the degree of the impact of the war in the Ukraine. I felt that I really needed to modify uh, my original plan of talk by uh, including that in my talk. But still, there are so many unknowns. Of course, I cannot predict the future, but still I can see some of the impact or the relationship between the two events. On one hand, there is a war and the crisis in Ukraine. On the other hand, we know that China is becoming uh, the most important player in the world, along with the United States. And the US-China confrontation is undoubtedly uh, uh, influencing the future course of international relations. So we are naturally a, 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 a curious perhaps about how the two things are interrelated. So of course, naturally my talk will be focusing on the issue. And uh, first of all, uh, some of the uh, points must be introduced. First, under the B Joe Biden administration, the US has shifted uh, from previous strategy of meeting challenges in the, in the, in, in the Asia-Pacific, the Middle East, and Europe to a new one which singularly points out China as the only competitor to the United States. So uh, previously, United States was preparing for a war in more than two theaters. Of course, it was difficult, but still, there are many challenges like uh, North Korea, Iraq, Iran and Russia as well. So that's why it was necessary for the United States to try to meet these challenges. But recently in the last one or two years, United States has shifted uh, from that previous strategy to a new one uh, by pointing out China as the only competitor to the United States. So this means that Russia was more or less uh, excluded from uh, the most important competitor to the United States. So in the sense, uh, I think that the United States began to think that it was no more necessary for the United States to deeply engage in security affairs in Europe or Euro Atlantic area. And I think that this naturally uh, reminded President Putin that uh, it was a good timing for Russia to invade uh, Ukraine because it was more likely that the United States government under Joe Biden, President Biden, was unlikely to engage in the conflict. So uh, more or less, uh, it would be natural so for, for President Putin to assume that uh, Russia had a free hand in controlling the area. And the second point is also important the two moves by the Biden administration might have encouraged President Putin to invade the Ukraine with its military force. Number one, United States retreated from Kabul in August last year. So this also reminded President Putin that it is quite a new trend that the United States was beginning to retreat from the world. And of course, the retreat from the Kabul could be regarded as an important signal or the symbol that the United States was no more world policeman. So in the sense, I felt that uh, this could send a very bad signal to President Putin or uh, President Xi Jinping of China. Number two, US, as I mentioned a bit before, US strategic shift uh, from the world to the Indo-Pacific region also reminded President Putin that the United States was much less interested in security strategic affairs in Europe, particularly in Ukraine. So uh, this became a wrong signal to President Putin and the Russian government uh, by uh, showing that the United States had 
seemingly had much less interest in European affairs by focusing on much on in the Pacific international relations. And then uh, this trend was clearly written in American security strategy document. In a report uh, entitled Interim National Security Strategy Guidance, published in March 2021, it was written that, quote, China, in particular, has rapidly become more assertive. It is the only competitor potentially capable of combining its economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to mount a sustained challenge to a stable and open international system, unquote. So this report, I mean, published by US government, White House, signified, as mentioned before, the new trend in US security policy, which meant that the United States lost its strategic interest in European theater. Wrongly, uh, this uh, could be, I think, felt by uh, both Xi Jinping and uh, President uh, uh, Putin as well. So uh, then, uh, well, this while uh, United States seemingly uh, showed its interest in focusing much more uh, international relations in the, in the Pacific. It is also important to remind that both Japan and the EU have promoted a new strategy uh, entitled Connective strategy, Connectivity Strategy. Japan and the EU have promoted the respective connective strategy, which strengthened the link between Europe and the Indo-Pacific. Besides, the EU published its own EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific in September 16, 2021, and said that the EU and the Indo-Pacific are highly interconnected. So this is a new trend as well. So this means that uh, Japan or Asia and EU or Europe are much more interconnected with both Japanese and EU strategies. And basically in the concept, regional concept of the Pacific is basically Japanese creation or Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's creation. He created and promoted the, wor the world of in the Pacific region. And also the quad, the world concept, the concept of the quad quadrilateral cooperation among United States, Japan, India, and Australia. This was also Shinzo Abe's creation. So he actually introduced, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe introduced a new strategy to focus on the importance of Indo-Pacific. And I think that the United States government and the EU, together with other leading powers, are following this course of focusing on the Indo-Pacific. While importance of Indo-Pacific is now widely known, recognized, but at the same time, Japan and the EU and some other countries are, 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 are becoming to connect to, to connect the two regions. Previously, in the Pacific or Asia was regarded as a, a kind of a far away region from Europe, of course. It takes more than 10 hours to get to East Asia or Northeast Asia. So many people thought that Asia is a far right place, a far right region for many European people. But nowadays, these kind of claims are much less hard. Many European people now think that Asia or Indo-Pacific region is much nearer than before, much nearer because we always talk about cyberspace. When we think about cyberspace, it is natural to assume that Europe is quite neighbor to in the Pacific region. So in the sense, I think that EU is much more aware about the importance of in the Pacific region because European member, EU member states, European countries are much more under attack, cyber attack of China. European countries are much more strongly aware of the fact that they are the targets of Chinese cyber attacks. So in the sense, even though geographically Asia is far away or Indo-Pacific region is far away, but at the same time, the importance of cyberspace actually makes European people 
to think that we really have to combine two regions into a single package, I mean, the European region and the Indo-Pacific region. And at the same time, another factor reminds us of the importance of connecting two regions. This is the increasing uh, cooperation between Russia and China. Russia is more isolated in Europe, you know, China is more isolated in Asia or in the Pacific region as well. That's why I think that the two power, two authoritarian powers now think that they really need to help each other because uh, both Russia and China are permanent member of United Nations Security Council. If they can collaborate, they are two powers among the five permanent members of UN Security Council. So they can get two vetoes. So they can occupy the discussion within the United Nations Security Council. So whenever they like to invade neighboring countries, United Nations Security Council actually cannot stop it because the two power, if they can collaborate each other, it means that they can control more or less United Nations Security Council because they have veto powers. That's why they can stop any resolution which can condemn them, their behaviors, their invasions, and so on. So in the sense, the combination and the collaboration between the two authoritarian powers, Russia and China, actually create a single space of Eurasian region. And based upon that cooperation, China has been expanding its own project, regional project of Belt and Road Initiative. So in the sense, uh, because of the increasing, expanding influence of China, particularly in Eastern and Central Europe, we now think about Eurasian continent as a single entity in which Russia and China play a very important role. And much more than that, we need to think that they are establishing their own spheres of influence in Europe and East Asia, respectively. So they're creating their own space to create and expand its sphere of influence. They need buffer zone and they need to reject the expanding influence of the United States. So on one hand, they feel that the United States, the power of the United States is declining, but at the same time, they feel that they need to refuse and reject expanding American military presence there. So in Asia, the two powers are trying to reject and deny American military bases, particularly in Japan, South Korea, and so on. And in Europe, at the same time, the two powers, particularly Russia, are trying to deny and reject the expansion of NATO's influence around there, NATO's influence in Georgia, in Belarus, and Ukraine as well. So Russia has been feeling that NATO's influence has been expanding. That's why, because as I mentioned before, Russia might have felt that now power of the United States is shrinking. It would be a nice timing to radically change the situation in Ukraine. So uh, this is a new trend because uh, five years before, 10 years before, when I visited European countries, many people there single-mindedly said and feel that China is the future of Europe. China will occupy and dominate international relations. That's why it is important to create a better relationship, much more friendly relationship with China. While rejecting and denying or ignoring other powers, I think that uh, many European powers felt that uh, it was extremely important for the United European Union to create a better relationship with China. So this actually, this trend uh, 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 became an important cause that in, in, in the East Asia, that China has been expanding its territories, its sphere of influence, because major powers actually accepted and actually agreed with 
So it's kind of Chinese invasion, but the trends is not reversed. So a uh, very uh, talented, uh, 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 very, very nice uh, Asian expert at the uh, German Marshall Fund, a think tank, Andrew Marshall mentioned in his uh, commentary that I quoted, quote, Europe is in the nascent stages of a new debate about China. Last year, of course, it was 2019. Last year, the European Union published a strategic outlook paper in which it labeled China as a systematic, systemic rival, reflecting a sharp change in its balance of assumptions about Sino-European relationship. The pandemic is tilting that balance further, unquote. So this is a new trend. In the last one or two years, uh, European Union and many member states of the EU have changed its attitudes towards China, particularly the UK is the most typical example because uh, uh, seven years before 2015, President Xi Jinping visited London. At the time, Prime Minister was David Cameron. David Cameron, Prime Minister Cameron said that the golden decade of UK-China relation has begun. So uh, naturally at the time, many UK political leaders uh, thought that China was becoming the most important partner to the U U UK. So uh, uh, this, this was a trend, but the trend was now reversed. And more and more European member states, EU member states uh, are, are thinking that uh, China and Russia are different parts uh, and they have different ideology. So that's why there is a clear limit in uh, the cooperation with these two authoritarian powers. And I think that the current crisis in Ukraine radically accelerated this trend furthermore. So let me move to the second and the next slide. The, the, the next question will be, will the war in Ukraine result in the war in Taiwan? And the title is Putin and Xi and a broken partner. On the 4th February 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin met with Chinese President Xi Jinping in Beijing on the sidelines of the Beijing Olympic game and issued a call for NATO to house the expansion. So at this moment, nearly a month before, it was regarded that it was perceived that President Xi of China was supporting basically Russian President Putin's stance on Ukraine or the expansion of NATO. So uh, we expected that the two powers had been collaborating very deeply on these kind of issues. But actually, it was not the case. And then uh, I will speak it about, talk about it later. But uh, before that, I would also like to mention that 81% of Japanese people respond that they have concern that Russian invasion to Ukraine will link to China's challenge to China's change to the status quo in Taiwan and in the Senkaku Islands. Nowadays, many people in Japan are thinking that a Chinese attack or invasion upon Taiwan is now much more likely than before because of the current trend. And I will examine whether this is true or not. Then, however, at the same time, we can see some gaps and difficulties in their approaches to the war in Ukraine. A China expert wrote, uh, Craig Singleton, wrote in his commentary for Foreign Policy magazine that, quote, I quote, Chinese President Xi Jinping's worst nightmare is playing out in Ukraine, regardless of whether he possessed detailed or advanced knowledge, sorry, uh, 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 knowledge of Russia's invasion plans. Two things are almost certain. Xi expected Russia's battle hardened military uh, to quickly root the Ukrainians, and the international community's response would be muted neither came to pass, unquote. So uh, it is quite likely that the Xi Jinping didn't know the exact plan about the invasion because uh, President Putin is extremely secretive. That's why 
it is likely that uh, President Putin didn't talk at all about detailed plan about the invasion. That's why uh, when I uh, read uh, uh, People's Daily or Global Times of China, uh, almost official papers, uh, it was clear that they were totally confused. Repeatedly, they wrote in, in the editorials that war is extremely unlikely and only the United States uh, is toying with the idea of the invasion and Russia has no interest in invading Ukraine or something like this. So there are many contradictions between what they wrote at the time and what now they wrote. So it means that they are frustrated and they are more or less betrayed. Chinese newspapers and the leaders are betrayed. But because soon after the invasion began, it was also likely that uh, President Putin communicated informed to Chinese government but that the, the war will be ended within a few days. So then, or well, Chinese government kept silent while supporting or at least abandoning the board to uh, deny and criticism Russian behavior. So uh, in the initial phase, China showed its wait and see attitude. But soon after it became quite unlikely that Russia could end the war within a, such a short period of time, Chinese frustration is becoming more and more quite uh, clear. So in the sense, I, 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 we can see some of the frustrations at the side of the Chinese government. And uh, one of the important points is that Japan is placed at the center of US-China strategic confrontation. In the 21st century, in the Pacific region is the most dynamic and the most economically powerful region. Japan is placed at the front line of the structure confrontation between the United States and China in this region. So in this sense, well, Japan now can play a key role in framing the future strategic relation in the region. Because for Japan, both the United States, China and China are important partners. United States is Japan's only alliance partner while China is Japan's biggest trading partner. That's why it is natural for Japan to think about uh, how we can best benefit from the future structural strategic relations between United States and China. While maintaining the strength of your Japan alliance, we also need to maintain our very close, strong business economic relationship with China. So in the result, I think that the Japanese government launched a new diplomatic doctrine, perhaps the most important diplomatic doctrine which Japanese government launched in the last 150 years. This is free and open Indo-Pacific vision. We call it FOIP, free and open Indo-Pacific. This is similar to EU's Indo-Pacific strategy in its emphasis on economic connectivity and the concepts of inclusiveness and the multilateralism. And uh, when, uh, uh, just before EU launched its own Indo-Pacific strategy and also its own EU, EU's connectivity strategy, I talked with some of the policymakers within the European Union and they naturally responded to me that they read carefully about Japanese strategic documents. Uh, such as free and open in the Pacific. And uh, they learned a lot of things from Japanese regional strategy of free and open in the Pacific. So nat it's natural to assume that there are many common things, commonalities between Japanese regional strategy and EU's regional strategy. Not just that, we have many things in common. We focus on the importance of both inclusiveness and multilateralism. And both United States, United States and China actually focus on the other things rather than this inclusiveness and multilateralism. So we have to combine two things. On one hand, we are now seeing the war in Ukraine, which can drastically change international order of the 21st century. But at the same time, we have to also look at the direction of US-China strategic confrontation because China can play a significant role in creating an armistice between Russia and Ukraine. So uh, some kind of 
Chinese irritation and frustration and doubts upon Russian invasion can create a space for China to play an important role to mitigate the conf confrontation between the two sides. This is exactly what China did in the North Korean crisis. In the North Korean crisis, because China had a very strong tie with North Korea, and you know, China can pressure North Korean policy on nuclear armament. That's why nuclear development, that's why trying to bridge a gap between the United States government and North Korean government, China started the six party talk and China played a very important role in trying to persuade North Korea to abandon nuclear programs. It didn't work very well and the six party talk, six party talk ended already, but still I think that it would be natural to assume that China is not thinking that China can play some role in the current war in Ukraine, because China also has a very strong tie with Ukraine as well. Chinese, Chinese military expansion of the last two decades could be possible because of Ukrainian, Ukrainian technologies. Ukrainian, U, U, Ukraine actually has supported Chinese military development, technological advance in many ways. And their economic relationship is also very strong between China and Ukraine. So that's why we can naturally assume that China has a great interest in trying to stop the war between the two very important China's partners. So China is becoming more and more important player in global politics. And I think that China is replacing previous Russian role in global politics. So we will see much more important US-China strategic confrontation. And we do not know whether the US-China strategic confrontation will be mitigated or will be expanded. It depends on how China will think about its own role in trying to see the, stop the war between Russia and Ukraine. And I'll stop here and I would, well, I'd like to listen to questions and comments afterwards. So I stop here, thank you very much for your careful attention. Thank you very much indeed.